recording. Um, hello, Th this is the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. It's our last official meeting of the fall. We will resume um, uh, when the spring semester begins. There will be a special event that's also open to the public in December. On Tuesday, December 20th, um, we'll have an in-person event in ITE 229 at UMBC in which the three groups in the Insure Research class will make presentations of their semester research projects. The topics include protocol analysis, malware analysis, and the cyber physical systems and security of the new UMBC classroom known as ILSB. Um, and we invite everybody to attend. Today, it's our uh, pleasure to have Dr. Peter Peterson, who's an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And he um, has been working on a variety of projects in adversarial thinking and is an active member on, on the uh, CATS project and the EPIC project. So we welcome him back to talk about some of his work on adversarial thinking. All right, uh, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I actually spoke to this group about a year and a half ago uh, in April of 2021 with, uh, if, if you were at that meeting, you'll recognize some of these slides. Most of the introductory material is, is reused, um, but some things have happened since then. Um, uh, the big one is that this project got funded. So um, last time I talked about the project, I had tried to get it funded as a career award. And if you're not familiar with what a career award is, um, it's a five-year grant from NSF that is meant to um, establish sort of pre-tenure people into a, a larger project where they can become an expert in a particular area and so on and so forth. Um, so I applied my, my last chance in July of 2021 um, after the talk and it did get funded, um, which, you know, of course you find out like nine months later. And so here we are now. Um, and so I'm excited because I'm actually doing the work now and I have a student working on it. Um, and because uh, I feel a little freer to talk about the my proposed approach for uh, tackling this. Whereas I, I kind of didn't go into what I was proposing to do just because I was still hoping that it would get funded. So I'm really excited to talk to you about it. And um, since I went over some of the introductory material in the past and since this is being recorded, and I've shared the slides here, I'll probably go through some of the introductory stuff a little bit faster than I normally would so that we can get to some of the more um, interesting discussions, have time for discussion and do an activity um, that this would be like a brand new trying something out um, because I know that you're an interested crowd. So without any further ado, uh, let's get into it. Um, so, uh, what is adversarial thinking, right? So, um, this is a crowd that's probably, uh, well familiar with the idea, but in case you're not, in case you're just joining us, um, adversarial thinking is this idea in, uh, cybersecurity and other kinds of security, um, that is the idea of putting yourself into the mindset of the attacker so that you can develop, um, secure systems. Or I guess if you want to break a system, you put yourself in the mindset of the attacker so that you can break it. Um, I've been working with a student, Kyle Rose at UMD on a survey that we'll talk about in a little bit. But I have been recently thinking about, Kyle and I chat about this all the time. Um, why don't we say, think like a defender, right? And I think it's because the assumption is that most of us are defenders. And so we have to think like attackers. But but if you're an attacker, thinking like a defender would be adversarial thinking. Um, we also, sometimes you hear people talk about it as a security mindset um, or security thinking. Um, and it's kind of widely thought of and written and spoken about by lots of people as kind of the uh, secret sauce of information security practice that you can't really be good at uh, security if you can't think adversarially, if you can't think like an attacker. And I guess the analogy might be, uh, you, you might not be a very good doctor 
if you can't think about um, how pathology might affect a patient, right, or, or how things could go wrong. Um, I want to pause just for one second and say uh, my practice usually with lecturing uh, or talking is uh, if you have questions, please throw them into the chat. I also will probably pause and, and ask uh, for questions uh, as I go. Um, but if you write them in the chat, I'll see them. They're right over here, um, and then I can respond to them. Anyway, back to adversarial thinking. Um, there really isn't any common definition. Okay, we have uh, these little aphorisms like think like an attacker, um, but we don't actually have a definition of what adversarial thinking is or what it isn't, what kinds of behaviors or thought processes are adversarial thinking, uh, which things are we really talking about? What does it mean specifically to think like an attacker? Um, because there are no, there's no definition, there's no test for it. Um, and so we can't be scientific about it. Um, there's also a question uh, of the value of saying, think like an attacker, okay? Um, Adam Shostak, who's uh, well known for his sort of uh, risk analysis, threat analysis work, uh, work for Microsoft and, and University of Washington and other places, he, he thinks that saying, well, think like an attacker, you know, just think like an attacker is sort of like telling most people to think like a professional chef. Well, what does that, what does that mean? I, when he asked me that, he said, well, think like a professional chef. I, I thought for a really long time, like, well, I, I don't really have any idea what that means. I think, oh, I can think of maybe you have to think about what to buy or maybe how to present stuff or, but I couldn't be specific about it at all. And so I think there's a secondary problem here that even the way we talk about things, think like an attacker may not be that helpful for people. The goals of this career project is to work towards sort of an accepted broader definition of adversarial thinking. Um, I don't necessarily think that at the end of this project, we're gonna have a categorical definition, but what we definitely wanna do is identify core aspects of AT. So things that a large number of experts agree represent adversarial thinking. And if we have a list of things, let's say top four or five behaviors or thought processes that represent adversarial thinking, then we can create and validate a test based on those um, important aspects. And once we have a, an assessment measure and, and some definition of components, then we can actually do experiments on interventions and curricula and things to find and evaluate uh, adversarial thinking. Um, so any questions about just this kind of introductory idea? <clears throat> All right, uh, if not. So again, the problem here is we talk about adversarial thinking, we say how important it is, but we can't be specific about it. So we can't measure it. Um, we can't really be scientific. If we could, right, then we could talk about AT beyond just anecdotes or stories that resonate with us in a particular way. We could measure it. We could see um, what kinds of people or groups of people might have a high level of adversarial thinking. Um, there's a little bit of debate uh, in the community about whether adversarial thinking is teachable or whether it's just an innate skill that certain people have. Um, we could evaluate that. Um, we could open the doors to other security education research. Um, and, you know, if you have a great idea for an activity that you think would improve adversarial thinking, well, if we create, if this project creates an assessment, now you could use that assessment to evaluate your intervention. Um, Alan's asking, what is known about AT in other domains such as sports? So, um, I'll talk very briefly at a high level about a couple different domains, so law and the military and games um, and uh, some things like that. Sports would be another really good place for me to dive into as a, as a different kind of game. Um, so I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is a good question because uh, it allows me to say that 
we care about adversarial thinking in other fields in so much as their conceptions of adversarial thinking are relevant for cybersecurity. So um, the goal of this project is to improve cybersecurity and what the cybersecurity community means when we talk about adversarial thinking. So, you know, it could be that, say, in sports or some other field, there's some aspect of adversarial thinking uh, that they use that's not particularly relevant to the cybersecurity context. And um, that's not something we would really dive into, but I'll touch on this in a little bit. Um, so introduction, uh, I'll talk about what the community says about AT, including some existing um, definitions or more formalizations, um, talk about uh, some of the cybersecurity community. Oh, that's a little redundant there, sorry. Uh, AT in other contexts. Uh, I'll talk about my project plan and uh, how we're gonna approach doing this. And then we'll actually go through a sample question, which some of you may have seen before, but the thing that's new is we're gonna actually try to grade that question today and see how that works. And I have never tried this before. So it is this is a live demo. Uh, it might be terrible. It might be really cool. We're all gonna learn together. So I really wanna get to that. So this is why I'm gonna hurry up. So uh, how do we talk about it in the community? Uh, principle of easiest penetration or path of least resistance. We talk about thinking about how things could fail instead of just thinking about how to get them to work in a particular way. Um, uh, you know, what's the worst input this program could get? I like the idea, uh, it's like programming Satan's computer, right? So if something could go wrong, it will go wrong in the worst possible way. Of course, uh, you don't have to be paranoid to be good at security, but it helps. Uh, all of that kind of thing. Um, Ron says, when a student thinks how the professor is going to evaluate the answer scripts, uh, can we say it belongs to AT? So uh, Ram, Ram, I guess, or, or maybe I'll say Ram. Um, are you saying like uh, when a student says, oh, I think that the evaluation script is just going to look for whether the correct answer was output so I'm just going to write a program to output the correct answers. Is that sort of uh, what your what your yeah. example is alluding to? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. That is absolutely uh, yes. <laughs> when a professor thinks how the student might misinterpret the assignment, uh, absolutely. I if I grade student homework, uh, I have students write some uh, things I call encryption labs which teach them how to, how basic encryption works, but using really terrible encryption so that they don't go out and try to use it for something important. Uh, I always run that code in a VM just because uh, I don't trust it at all. Um, Gary says, what mission purpose would an adversary have as the goal to be achieved by a cyberspace attack? Right, so that's a great, um, seems like a more of an articulation of think like an attacker. What are the specific goals of the adversary? Um, and then potentially also, what are the uh, mechanisms or tactics? So I'll, I'll mention tactics versus strategy later. What are the particular tactics that they might be interested in using? Um, and Ed is mentioning um, or asking, would it be useful to think about adversarial thinking in relation to this, some formal models like Dole of Yao? Uh, yes, I think that would be actually very interesting because um, those formal models, and thank you for that idea. Um, that is a really great, I've been playing around with um, Meeting Mayhem, uh, and which is very cool. And that's a great question because specific ways that things can go wrong, and uh, for the defender anyway and we can't or pathways for the attacker then we might be able to list those things enumerate those things and say well what are the things that an individual human does in order to go down those pathways and um, if they're distinct then those might be different aspects of adversarial thinking so um, thank you that's a i really like that idea a lot and i will definitely pursue it um, all right so do people really think at is important Yes, okay, um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I linked to the slides and there are links. These, these links are references to the papers, 
So there have been a lot of papers written and articles where people talk about adversarial thinking and its importance. Uh, it's, it's sort of a pervasive idea. Okay. Um, and in addition to it being sort of a pervasive idea that people talk about, um, it is also the target for a number of um, interventions. Okay. So um, a number of instructors or faculty or, or people have tried to create games or leverage games in order to um, help students think adversarially outside of a, a technical context um, so that hopefully they can apply those same thought processes inside of a technical context. Um, and so uh, Control Alt Hack, for example, is a card game um, by Tamara Denning, Adam Shostak, and um, Yoshi Kono. Doxed is another game. Um, that's not me, Peterson, that's a different um, Peterson. Um, the Kobayashi Maru exercise, uh, if you don't know, that is an amazing paper you should read where um, students were tasked on a midterm to write down 100 digits of pi um, with the understanding that most students wouldn't be able to memorize it, and so they would have to cheat. Um, and the instructors would take a kind of um, moderate but lazy assessment of whether students could be caught cheating, right? And so um, students found all these creative ways to uh, provide the numbers to them so that they could write them down in, in this uh, class, really cool. Um, build it, break it, fix it, and do this and nothing more. Uh, this do this and nothing more is, is this Peterson. Um, these are systems where uh, students create software and then try to break each other's software in kind of a gamified um, environment um, and other things, right? I, I put uh, meeting mayhem here as well, right? Um, things that try to get students thinking adversarially. Um, Gary says, Schneider's comments related to teaching adversarial thinking as the purpose for cybersecurity courses is interesting in the AT has not been the result of that education. Yeah, so I think I think that is an interesting point um, that the article talks about how AT is so uh, essential for education or the purpose of cybersecurity education, but most cybersecurity courses are more focused on um, technical content um, and less so on teaching students this thought process. Um, that's a that that's a whole extra rabbit hole, but absolutely. Um, and now let's talk about some community anecdotes. Um, some nice uh, fail images here of a. It's a little blurry, but uh, there's a, a a gate here. But of course, there's no fence, and so you can drive right around it. Uh, same idea here. Uh, I'm not even sure what this is supposed to accomplish. And. Uh, a chain that's been zip tied together. Um, of these three, I think the chain with the zip tie is one of my favorites because it is both uh, an example of soft security, right? That an adversarial thinker, if they saw it, would immediately say, well, that's uh, not going to work. But on the other hand, it could be a, a well considered choice in an emergency if, for example, the adversaries are on the other side of the fence, right? And they can't see that zip tie. They might assume uh, that the fence is secured, even though it isn't. Um, these are more funny than, than anything else. Um, the community also has a number of anecdotes that, uh, that we talk about or that we hear come up again. Uh, Bruce Schneier uh, talked a lot about um, Uncle, Mil Uncle Milton's ants. You know, uh, you don't get ants with the ant farm. What you get is a card that allows you to order live ants to be shipped to your home. Um, and of course, there's no verification that those ants are going to the purchaser of an ant farm and not say, my worst enemy. Okay, and you can order bees and bed bugs and other kinds of insects and things like that as well. Um, lots of people talk about um, noticing the lack of security in a store and how you could shoplift or think about how you could vote twice. Um, whether you uh, divide yourself, put yourself in as a maker or a breaker, um, printing barcodes, fake boarding passes. Uh, one I read about in the last year was 
uh, people putting fake QR codes on points of payment, like for parking meters or um, scooter rentals. And so you go uh, to the QR code and you pay someone you think is the person you're trying to pay, but it's actually phishing essentially. Um, the Netflix prize paper, really great uh, classic uh, DN de anonymization paper. Um, XKCD's famous $5 wrench. Uh, I asked on Mastodon recently about this and, and uh, uh, someone mentioned how they noticed that when they did fire drills, all the physical security protocols in the building uh, were off. And so all the doors could be used as entrances for people returning into the building um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I, Gary says, uh, cybersecurity requirement, chain the gate closed with a padlock. Did it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, there was a padlock and a chain involved and the, and the padlock went through two loops of the chain. Absolutely. Um, but the assurance was not part of the requirement. Um, yeah, and Ennis is just saying that against certain types of adversaries, uh, a zip tie can actually be pretty, pretty reliable. Um, other things that the community talks about is encouraging um, people to ask what if questions. Well, what if a meteor destroys our data center? What if there's a flood? Uh, what if there's a zero day vulnerability? Uh, and so on. Um, everybody, of course, knows how to lock a bike the right way through the tire. Um, Tempest, I think, is a great example. And if you're not familiar with Tempest, that's a nice rabbit hole for you to go down, basically saying, well, what if we could point an antenna at a television or uh, an electric typewriter and uh, figure out what is being viewed or typed um, and going on to, to figure out how to do that? Uh, and I know want my sticker. This is a story. Uh, my daughter, when she was two, we're trying to teach her to brush her teeth and, you know, she brushed her teeth, she'd get a sticker. And that was just the most amazing reward and, and incentive for her. And uh, so, you know, that was just how we rolled. And one night she refused to brush her teeth. She, you know, you know, did this whole thing. And I said, well, well, honey, if you don't brush your teeth, you won't get your sticker. And she just looked at me and said, I know want my sticker. And then I had nothing, right? She, she was like, well, that's your only move, dad. And when I take that away, you got nothing, right? Um, so I'm sure that you all have examples. Uh, some of you have put them in the chat. Um, please feel free to, to put some more in there. Um, uh, Russ Fink is talking about uh, APL handles pointing down. They were D-shaped. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, when protesters could chain them shut from the outside. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, so what I would encourage you to think about is, is these examples or other examples that you might be thinking about and ask yourself, what is similar about all these examples? What are the common themes uh, of the kinds of things that we say represent adversarial thinking, because those themes and, and repeated ideas uh, could be ways for the community to get a more firm understanding of what adversarial thinking actually is. Um, I really want to get to our, our activities, so I'm going to keep moving forward. Um, have people tried to define it in or formalize it in some way? And there are at least a few uh, things in the literature uh, we're going through the literature right now to make a survey, um, and so I'm sure we'll find more. Uh, Fred Schneider talked about uh, adversarial thinking as being identifying the possible player actions, so the moves within the constraint space that the player can take, um, thinking about it like game theory. Um, Melissa Dark and Yelena Murkovic talked about it in terms of exploiting and subverting rules, which um, is maybe a, a slight different perspective on player actions. It's essentially saying, well, what are the actions that I can take that maybe um, you didn't think I could take? Um, and finding ways to alter the operational space, right? So if there's some way that I can, you think I can't do something because uh, there's some um, control in place, but if I can alter the space in an unexpected way, now this opens up um, my play space. Um, uh, Hammond, Seth Hammond and Hopkinson 
tried to look at adversarial thinking through something called Sternberg's triarchic theory of intelligence, which breaks intelligence down into analytical intelligence, creative intelligence, and practical intelligence. And um, so they, they try to say, well, what's the analytical part of adversarial thinking? Maybe it's your, um, your raw intelligence or the skills that you have. Um, the creative part of adversarial thinking would be seeing possibilities or um, unique ideas or connections. And the practical component is thinking about long-term strategies. So that's uh, one, uh, another one. And then of course the CATS project um, led by Dr. Sherman and uh, Dr. Herman in Illinois and Linda Oliva uh, at UMBC. They did a Delphi study to identify core security concepts uh, tied to adversarial thinking. And so these concepts are things like identify vulnerabilities and failures, attacks against the CIA triad and authentication, um, building defenses, identifying goals, and identifying targets and attackers. And so the CCI and the CCA, which you've probably heard about, um, are built around those concepts. Um, so, uh, and, and this was also a Delphi process. We'll talk about uh, something about that in a second, which is something I'm also going to use. Um, but of course, all of these ideas, uh, while interesting and good, uh, are not necessarily um, broadly understood as describing adversarial thinking. So these are all excellent uh, places to start and to consider. Um, and if one is uh, widely accepted, then it can kind of rise to the top. Uh, otherwise, maybe we'll find a new one. Um, so other views, Alan had asked about um, sports. Uh, we're also looking at things like military, legal, business, uh, games, and so on. Um, you know, Sun Tzu, for example, uh, was big on sort of knowing thy enemy, on the idea of deception, uh, the path of least resistance. And um, in military circles, they'll talk about Milkoa, uh, which I had never heard of, but is essentially path of least resistance, right? It's the most likely course of action for uh, an adversary. Um, I'm sure this group is well familiar with the idea of a kill chain, a sequence of necessary steps for an attack uh, that must be completed. And if, if it's interrupted, then, then the attack can't be completed. Um, similar idea is something called the OODA loop, uh, which is this decision loop process where you take in information, you analyze it, you make a decision, and then you execute that plan. And um, in certain circles, people talk about getting inside the adversary's OODA loop. So if you can change things faster than the adversary can process the information, um, then they will not be able to defend against you. Um, I've been looking at Machiavelli. Uh, Machiavelli is interesting because a lot of what he talks about is more human factors, about how humans and human society works, uh, and less about um, targeted strategy. Uh, so, so I think that'll be interesting. But there's more here. Um, and it, you know, in games, we think about tactics versus strategies, where tactics are individual steps or a small number of steps that one might use to accomplish a short-term goal. And a strategy is a longer term goal that we're using tactics to advance. And so I imagine that sports has similar um, terms and ideas, but I haven't looked too much into that. Um, I'm going to take a second to look at the, the chat because people have been throwing things in there. So if you have other questions, please go ahead and jump in there. Um, Kai Wantia talks about uh, input validation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, hand it off to a friend and say, try to break this. And we often try much harder if the goal is to break it rather than if it's our own thing, we really are invested in it working correctly. And of course, that's why we have red teams. Uh, Gary mentions um, engineers are taught to think in the framework of how to make something that works um, and how I can break it is uh, not a common part of that thinking. I think that's absolutely true, Gary. Um, and I think um, like CS students, when they're developing code, they are thinking about how do I make my program uh, do what it's supposed to do, right? They're, they're not thinking about how do I make sure that this program can't fail catastrophically because that's not part of the assignment. Uh, and so they may end up learning bad habits 
as they just go towards the feature or the solution uh, and not on building something that's robust. And in terms of engineering, you know, we often hear things like, well, if if cars work the way software works, you know, blah, 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 insert bad thing. Um, but I also think that in, in the physical engineering world, the constraints, the attacks are, are much better known, right? So uh, you build a bridge, you know how the materials function, you know how they wear, you know the wind that's going to knock it down and so on. Um, there aren't really zero day attacks on, you know, reinforced concrete. Um, but that is something that happens in cybersecurity. And so I think it changes the way that we think about it. Um, Gary mentions also um, OP4 uh, that seeks to present the adversary to the friendly forces as part of the training. Um, is that sort of, I'm taking that as kind of a know thy enemy um, type of approach. So again, uh, I'm running out of time. So the, the goal of this project has uh, is to uh, describe the critical aspects of AT instrument and create this assessment um, and then perform experiments on that validated assessment okay um, and and so that's the big picture that's why this really is going to take a five-year project because getting that description takes a lot of time and we're going to use a delphi panel uh, similar to cats which i'll talk about momentarily and then instrumenting and validating the test is also going to take a considerable amount of time because we have to get a lot of people to take it and revise it and so on uh, and then, of course, once we have it, we can use it. So um, for the description phase, we're in the process of doing an a extensive literature review on um, AT, focused primarily on cybersecurity, but also drawing in elements from other fields. We also have a pool of experts who have talked about AT um, or who are professional um, security practitioners who use AT in their career, and also people who work with um, special groups of people who have particular AT needs, like activists or journalists, um, sex workers, and other type uh, other types of groups. And so these experts have knowledge about um, what uh, vulnerable groups need uh, in order to stay safe. And so we'll be interviewing those experts and also doing a Delphi panel. Uh, and the way that a Delphi panel works is you have this cohort of experts. Um, the facilitator provides a set of questions to the experts around this thing that we're trying to resolve, such as what are the core components of adversarial thinking? Um, the cohort answers those questions asynchronously, let's say via email. The facilitator summarizes all of those responses and sends them back to the cohort uh, for comment and uh, potentially with new questions. And then what we're gonna do is in a Delphi panel, you loop through that iterative process a certain number of times or until you find consensus. And so um, that's how we're going to try to get this group of approximately 35 experts to identify what they believe are the most common uh, or most important aspects of adversarial thinking. Um, and then, of course, instrumentation. So we're creating this assessment. Uh, it, importantly, will be non-technical um, so that anyone can take it. And so the way that we'll do that is the questions will target the kinds of thought processes and behaviors that we feel uh, are or represent adversarial thinking, but won't depend on technical knowledge like how to do a buffer overflow or SQL injection and so on. Um, it won't be multiple choice because uh, adversarial thinking has this characteristic that you can't see the answer, but then when somebody points it out to you, it's like, oh, obviously, why didn't I think of that? And so our feeling is that multiple choice questions aren't really going to work very well because they might allow people to find the right answer when they otherwise wouldn't have been able to. So there'll be open-ended questions um, probably people will be able to write multiple answers and they'll be graded individually, or maybe they can write multiple answers and select their what they think is their strongest answer, uh, and we'll grade these answers on a multi-dimensional rubric. And so um, what that means is, you know, the rubric has multiple dimensions, and this is not anything that I've committed to by any means, but 
For example, those dimensions could be how creative is the answer on a scale from one to five? Um, how practical is this answer? Like, is this something that could be done in the real world that a person could, you know, practically do? Uh, and then how likely is that answer to actually succeed to accomplish the goal in question? Um, right, you could have a really boring but really surefire uh, adversarial attack, and that's kind of this red box here, right? It's like uh, very likely to succeed, not very creative. Uh, well, in this case, I'm sorry, not very practical, so not surefire because maybe you wouldn't be able to pull it off. Or you could have something that's incredibly creative but not actually likely to succeed at all. And And, of course, what you'd really like to see are things out here that would be floating in the foreground, really likely to succeed, really creative, um, eminently practical, okay? Um, and I'm hoping, I'm planning to inspire the questions based on lateral thinking puzzles, which are sort of open-ended scenarios um, where in a puzzle riddle format, there is a specific question that a facilitator is looking for, but in the context of an adversarial thinking test, it would be more like saying, how many solutions to this problem can you come up with? I see there are questions here or comments. People are talking about concrete eating bacteria, which I absolutely love. Um, and Kaiwanti is talking about a project, uh, Peter Allen and Tomas, uh, we're working on potentially looking at um, personality traits through a personality assessment and uh, cybersecurity uh, personality. Um, Russ is asking, why is creativity a desired uh, quantity? I, again, to emphasize, I'm not sure that it will be in the final uh, actual assessment, um, but I think one of the things that we value or we recognize in um, a lot of adversarial thinking is that creative thinking finds pathways that um, sort of non-creative thinking doesn't see as a possible approach, right? And so, um, you know, if there are highly likely to work and highly practical and highly creative solutions, I think those are likely to be um, attacks that um, people are unlikely to see, but that would work really well. Um, okay, so uh, then of course we have to validate it and I'm gonna really breeze over this, but in short, that means analyzing it for bias to make sure that um, all you know, adult English speakers can take the test and understand its content um, and, and perform equally. Uh, having people work through the problems in person, it's kind of what we're doing here, but not really. And this is not a research study. Don't worry, I'm not releasing or publishing this. Um, give uh, to many people and various subjects and score them with multiple folks to make sure that it's fair and consistent and that the questions all provide a certain value uh, of information and revise. Um, and then we get to do experiments once it's validated. You know, which population has the most AT? Uh, does this curriculum improve AT? Does a particular intervention um, improve AT? What's the average level of AT in infosec professionals? You know, it would be pretty wild if we build this, everyone agrees that it, rep it measures AT, then we give it to a bunch of information security professionals and they perform poorly on it. I don't want that to happen, but uh, if that happens, that would be uh, quite a result. Um, okay, so we've got to our sample question. I have, uh, I've got about 20 minutes, 15 minutes. I have a class after this. So here's the question. And if you took it, uh, if you were here when I spoke a year and a half ago, um, you'll recognize this. Um, I'll read it and then I'm gonna give us about five minutes and I'd like you to write down, um, not in the chat yet, um, your solutions to the problem. So here's a scenario. Uh, a town installed an automated speed trap on Main Street. The system consists of two computerized cameras on Main Street. One camera takes pictures of license plates as cars drive into town, and the other camera does the same as they leave town. The picture data includes the exact time that the image was taken. If not enough time has passed between the two pictures, the registered owner of the car will get a speeding ticket with the fine automatically adjusted based on the speed calculated from the elapsed time. And the question is, 
how many ways can you think of that would allow someone to speed on Main Street, not get caught, um, and have some benefit from it? Okay, so that's the question. How many ways could someone speed on Main Street, given this situation, uh, and not get caught? And ideally benefit from it, but that's less important. How could you speed on Main Street, given this situation, and not get caught? So I'm going to give us five minutes or so, and I just want you to write down as many solutions as you uh, can think of. Um, clarification to Kaiwantia, for you, the driver, to not be penalized, okay? That, that's an important clarification, so thank you. And um, it would be better if you don't write your answers in the chat right now, and we'll talk about them in a, in a minute or two, a few minutes. Uh, all right, in the interest of time, let's talk about uh, people's answers. So there are a couple here in the middle. Uh, do a U-turn in the middle, absolutely. Drive into town, uh, make a U-turn and drive back out. Uh, speed all the way, but rest. Um, I call this the long lunch. So uh, you speed into town, speed to the diner, have a nice long lunch and speed out of town. And uh, you absolutely save time, but you don't get caught. Uh, change your number plate. Here in Minnesota, a lot of students write things like uh, cover the license plate with snow. Uh, switch cars, absolutely. Uh, that's another good one. Blackmail or bribe, that's another good one. Um, speed until they approach the camera. Use a cover to hide the license plate. That's like the old Knight Rider license plate flipper. Um, these are all good ones. Um, swerve to out of view of the camera. Uh, burn cloud, rub cloud or rubber, absolutely. Um, time your heist to the exact, yes, DST. Uh, I was wondering if someone was going to mention that, right? So uh, time your heist to the exact moment that clocks, uh, actually, I think you would want spring forward, right? So that the moment you start speeding, you get an hour added to your uh, duration. Lasers, you could blind the camera. I assume that's what you're saying. So uh, I have asked this question to a lot of people, um, and I have about 20 categories of answers. Okay, so uh, let me let me expand this. So obscure the plate um, with or without modification. Drive without a plate. Blind the cameras with or without modification. Um, Use someone else's plate or car. Um, hack the computer or the clocks. Uh, time tricks like daylight savings, the long lunch, right? Uh, or the U-turn, evade the camera. 
uh, joyride. You just speed back and forth in town for fun um, until the time has elapsed and then you leave. Uh, you just barely speed. Um, you assume that there's some threshold uh, above which they will not give you a ticket. And so you technically speed, but hopefully not get a ticket. Um, sue them, take them to court to prove it was you. Uh, drive, you know, at the speed of light or so fast that uh, the camera won't work. Um, my personal favorite answer, uh, speed backwards in the long, uh, in the wrong lane uh, and maybe get a profit if the time is negative. Uh, bribe someone. Assume that sometimes you can speed and just not get a ticket. Uh, become a police officer and then you get to speed in town and not get tickets. Um, or not use a car. Um, so a question from someone who can't type, how much does my action relate to my goal in speeding? Um, in, so that's an interesting question, but I'm not as concerned with the goals per se in this, uh, in this question. How much does my action relate to my goal in speeding? Yeah, I think it's more about thwarting the trap than it is about the goals or the actions. Um, okay, so here's what I want to do now. Um, oh, I do have one question. Do you think that thinking of answers to this question is or exercises something akin to adversarial thinking? Uh, why or why not? Any thoughts? You want our opinion as to whether yep, we absolutely. think this? Yep. Oh, can you repeat the question? Do you think that answering a question like this exercises the same kinds of thought patterns that you identify with adversarial thinking in, say, a cybersecurity context? Well, in as much as I'm qualified to evaluate what is adversarial thinking, yeah, I feel it. It presents a challenge. It's a lot of fun. And, uh, the answers we got here were highly creative and really poked at every boundary around the system, it feels like. That's my hope, obviously. <laughs> but it's also okay if people say no. I'd be definitely interested if if people are like, I don't really think it's like that because whatever. Um, okay, so we looked at the list of answers that I have. Uh, and so what I'd like to do in, I don't, Alan, can you go all the way up to one or do you need to cut it off? I have no hard time deadline. All right, so um, here's what I'd, what I'd like you to do. Go to this Google form. Um, it does not require sign in um, and what I'd like you to do is try to grade, um, there's nine answers there, um, grade them on um, creativity, likelihood of success, and practicality, and I'll grade them too. Um, I'm only gonna give you about five minutes because we're running out of time, so just give it your gut answer, um, and then we'll be able to look at the answers here and see, do we have consensus about um, how creative these answers were or not. If we if we disagree, then our, our answers should be just kind of random noise, right? But if we do tend to agree, even without any instructions about how to define those terms, um, if we do agree, then that suggests that maybe we would be able to um, to grade in this way. So I'm I'm going to do this too. And I will stop us in about four minutes. So again, um, please just grade quickly.
So you should be able to see the results once you complete. Uh, I'm going to give us two more minutes and then I'll look at the results to give people a chance to finish. Uh, Gary has a comment here uh, about how how the goal is relevant um, if it's simply to kind of thwart the mechanism or thumb your nose, um, then that's a, a simpler goal than say achieving something more nuanced or or complex. Uh, I absolutely agree, and and my hope is that we'll develop other questions that are less. This one is great because it has that kind of like you know, anything goes uh, set of answers. I'm hoping we'll come up with things that are more interesting, but that also have a latitude of possible answers. Um, in case people are still um, rating, I'm just gonna make sure I, I hit the rest of my slides. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna conclude after this, but, um, we need this definition of adversarial thinking if we're going to talk about it as being important. And if it is important, we really need to be able to evaluate it so that we can use it in experiments and figure out where AT is, who has it. You know, if you can find people that are really good at AT, you can presumably teach them the technical material. Um, but if someone, you know, is, isn't good at AT, then we need to figure out how can we improve their AT ability if, in fact, it is important. Um, all right, so uh, let's look at the results. And um, so this is the, the time trick. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And people thought it was pretty creative. We're a little bit split on how practical it is. Um, and it doesn't seem like it's that likely to succeed um, in general. Um, minor modification, not too creative, it seems like. Pretty practical. Um, is it likely to succeed? Well, more people think yes. Sorry, this is reminding me that I have a class coming up. Otherwise, I would miss everything. Um, but also a lot of disagreement. The long lunch, how creative is it? Wow, so here's our Gaussian curve. People can't decide if this is a creative uh, answer or not. Uh, it's very practical and very likely to succeed. Uh, this is very interesting to me. I'm going to spend a bunch of time thinking about that later. Um, just do it. Just speed and hope you don't get caught. Not very creative. Very practical in general, but probably not likely to work. Um, Elevation of privilege, becoming a police officer, um, pretty even spread on how creative it is. Not too practical in general, uh, but if you did it, it would work. Um, taking a U-turn, kind of middle of the road creativity, maybe leaning towards creative. Uh, I think it's pretty practical personally, but the, the votes here suggest that some people don't think it's very practical. Uh, also very likely to succeed. Um, speed slightly, not too creative, uh, very practical. Um, oh, interesting. People thought it was pretty likely to succeed. Um, profit, very creative. This is driving backwards, speeding backwards in uh, against the flow of traffic. Um, how practical is it? No, not very practical to speed while driving backwards. Uh, how likely is it to succeed? Here we have uh, quite a big spread. Um, and so that's that's amazing. Bribing, not too creative, middle of the road, um, not very practical, 
and an interesting spread on likelihood of success. So uh, that is very, very interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, I hope that you enjoyed that. Um, I'm looking at the comments, Russ, I'm glad you liked it. Um, that would be really fun uh, to do at Usenix Security. That is absolutely, absolutely true. I would love to do that. Um, yeah, uh, the point of the question I relayed and to Gary's question, succeed and goal seem linked um, in some of these examples. Um, yes, I think that's true. Um, and yeah, so most of the answers that I put here, I have filtered out ones that obviously won't work um, because these come from my list of sort of categories of potential solutions. All right, um, any final comments or questions? Because I need to switch over to Zoom my security class, um, but I have a couple minutes. How will you grade answers? Um... So we will have some kind of a rubric that is multidimensional um, and has guidance for what the different votes mean. Unlike today, where I just put it on a Likert scale and left you to interpret what those words meant. Um, and then there will probably be um, some kind of an alignment phase where, where raters are given sample questions that we have scored in a particular way and then walk them through why we feel that it's scored in a certain way so that uh, graders and raters can kind of be aligned in terms of how they apply that rubric. Um, again, I don't know how many dimensions there will be or what those particular ideas um, will be, whether it's creativity, likelihood of success, or practicality. Th these are just ones that I'm playing with right now. Um, but that is essentially how grading would work. And then um, higher scores would essentially be worth more points. Uh, and then a another question again is, could a student get scores for all of their answers? Do they get a score? Do they get the highest scoring answer? Um, up to three, we're not quite sure uh, how that'll work out, but that's something to figure out down the road. Other questions? Uh, really glad you liked it. Uh, Kaiwanti, I agree. Inter-reader reliability is a concern, and that's why uh, we would test this a bunch and have some alignment exercises. Um, it will be recorded. Alan is recording it, and he'll find a way to post it. Um, how to do AT when the goal doesn't have an adversary? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, it makes me think of like climbing a mountain, right? There's not really an adversary per se. Um, yeah, well, thank you. I'm sorry that this is like an info blast um, and kind of had to run out the door at the end, but I really enjoyed this. If you have any ideas or things you want to chat with me about it, um, you should absolutely feel free to reach out to me. I love talking about this stuff. So thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks all.